This week's episode of our show has been sponsored by Dungeon Fog. Dungeon Fog's web-based map-making platform is perfect for any dungeon master looking to create their own custom maps. Using Dungeon Fog, you can create gorgeous homebrew battle maps from multi-level dungeons to natural environments and much, much more. You can export high-res maps to print or use on a virtual tabletop, or even send a Fog of War version to a TV or projector. A premium subscription includes over 3,000 high-resolution map-making assets, with dozens more added every month. Follow the links in the description below or visit DungeonFog.com to try it out for your next game. And now, on to this week's episode. Greetings, my name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And, and we, we are, are the Dungeon, Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we cover everything Dungeons and Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos on Tuesday and Thursday, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. If you're considering becoming a Dungeon Master and running your own games of Dungeons and Dragons, one of the first pieces of advice you might have heard is that you need to read the rule books. The three big core rule books, Player's Handbook, Dungeon Master's Guide, and Monster Manual. Here you go, Kelly. Have fun reading 900 pages. This is going to take me the better part of a couple months. I'm a pretty slow reader, so this is daunting and not something that I really want to get into. If you're just getting started with D&D, it can be really intimidating for somebody to say, read these three books and try to memorize as much of it as possible. Reading the core rule books cover to cover is completely unnecessary for a new dungeon master or even an experienced dungeon master. It can be a lot of fun as a thought experiment to read through some of the monster manuals, some of the spells in Dungeons and Dragons and get lots of great inspiration. But if you are setting out to run your very first Dungeons and Dragons campaign, whether you are brand new to D&D at all, or whether you are experienced with D&D and setting out to run a campaign for the first time taking up the mantle of Dungeon Master, it's not necessary to read all the rules, but it is a good idea to read some of them. <laughs> as you spend time as a DM and as years go past and you are learning the game more and more, there's a good chance that in time you will absorb a lot of what these books have to offer. But if you're setting out to just get started with Dungeons and Dragons and you're hoping to get a grasp of the rules that you need to know, today we're going to talk about the sections of these books that we think are most important for you to understand before setting out on your D&D adventures. Most importantly, we're going to be citing some of the page numbers in these books so you can follow along with your own bookmarks and mark these books up and know how to use them at the table when you need to reference something really, really quickly. It's often more important as a dungeon master while you're running the game to know where to find the rule that you're looking for to clarify something rather than having that perfectly memorized. So as we go through the books today, we're going to highlight what are the key sections that you should probably read and what you should bookmark so that you've got that handy as a reference table during the game. There's a lot to discuss today, so let's get rolling. So let's kick things off with the most important book that you have at your disposal when getting into D&D, and that is the Player's Handbook. You might be really tempted to read through all the player options in this book when you first pick it up as a DM, reading over all the classes, the races, the spells, and the feats. And the truth of the matter is, is that you probably want to just practice making a character on your own and then read over the spells, classes, and feats that your players have actually taken first. Something that can be a little bit misleading is you might think as a new Dungeon Master, the first book you should read cover to cover is the Dungeon Master's Guide. But actually more information in the player's handbook is going to be useful even for new DMs out there than what you might find in some of the other books. Even though it's called the player's handbook, do not give it a pass because you think it doesn't have relevant information. It is chock full of useful information for DMs, and there are some sections that are nearly essential for DMs to understand. If you are a new dungeon master setting out for the very first time, you should read the introduction. It's only four pages from page five to eight, and it just has a really useful summary of the core gameplay loop of Dungeons and Dragons, reminding you of how things like advantage and disadvantage work and what it means to ask for a dice roll. The essence of what you need to know to play D&D is all found in this introductory chapter. 
But if you want to get to the meat of everything that we're talking about, you can find most of that in Chapter 7 of the Player's Handbook. Chapter 7 is from page 171 to 179. It's only about 8 pages, and it explains how ability scores work in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Ability scores being the core mechanic that make up all players in a Dungeons & Dragons game, it's important that all the players and the Dungeon Master understand how they work and how they can be used at the table. This chapter is really useful for understanding the difference between an ability check, an attack roll, and a saving throw, and it gives you great guidelines on how the ability scores actually work in play and when you should ask for that strength check or stealth check or that intelligence history check. Out of this entire section, you should bookmark page 174, which includes all of the DCs for ability checks that you're probably going to be using at the table. Right after chapter 7, you can jump right into chapter 8, which is page 181 to 186. This covers a lot of the rules for exploration and role playing. Even though these rules are a little bit more loose and up to the imagination, there are a lot of really important things in this chapter that are great to keep in mind when you're running a game of D&D. Afterwards, though, you will want to dive into the rules in chapter 9, which are the combat rules. This is probably the meatiest section of the book, and D&D is a game about combat. It's a centerpiece of the experience. This is the section of the book that is the most finicky and specific and deserves your closest read. Combat in general requires the most amount of rules in Dungeons & Dragons, where a lot of the game is left up to imagination and interpretation, the rules for combat are much more structured. So this is a really important section for you to understand and memorize what you can before setting out for your games. You will want to bookmark page 192, which explains the fundamental actions that you can take in combat. Oftentimes, these actions that you can take in combat are summarized on great resources like Dungeon Master screens, and there's tons of amazing handouts for these, so I do encourage you to seek those out. We'll have some useful links to some of those in the description below. There's few things that a new Dungeon Master with a new group of players is going to reference more often than the summary of the actions players can take in combat. As we jump into chapter 10, pages 201 to 205, this covers spellcasting, which is one of the more complex areas of the game. Similar to combat, spellcasting has a lot of rules and regulations that make it work at the table. So it is really important to read this section and understand it. There are at this point hundreds of spells and you don't need to read all of them. What's more important here is to bookmark something like page 202, which includes things like concentration and casting times. After chapter 10, you go into a massive section of the player's handbook that covers hundreds of spells, which it's impossible to memorize them all. I don't have them memorized. And I know a lot of them, but I don't have them memorized. Do you? No. No, and I even get them wrong time and time again in my own games. The key thing with spells is that when your players take them, when they level up when they're making your new characters, that is when you should read them. The most difficult thing to manage as a new dungeon master are all the unexpected surprises that your players are gonna pull out as they improvise actions. The spells are a tricky thing because the spells are the players getting permission to do tricky things that might surprise you by the rules. So that's why they're really worth reading, but you only need to read the ones that your players are actually going to take or the ones your villains are going to use. We've done a lot of videos covering the spells in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, so you might want to check out our various playlists talking about those where we do discuss some of the more fun tricks that you can pull off with magic in D&D. Finally, tucked away way at the back of the player's handbook on page 290 are the conditions. This can be a little confusing because conditions are referenced all over the place, but you don't actually know what they are until you get to the end of the book. So we highly recommend looking at page 290 and understanding the different and various conditions that are available to Dungeons & Dragons, how they work, how they interact with each other, so that when they come up and play, you have a quick reference. It's also really handy to bookmark this page as well. It's also really handy to have a Dungeon Master screen because this will have a lot of the rules inside for the actions in combat and conditions instead of having to flip through the book to find them. So that's our reading list for the player's handbook specifically and our handy cheat sheet. Definitely worth having both of these things together. But as we put down the player's handbook, let's pick up the Dungeon Master's Guide and crack this one open because I think of all the core rulebooks, how much of this 
a DM needs to read is perhaps the most unclear. Because this is definitely the book that you don't need to read cover to cover. <laughs> now, before we jump into how little of this book you actually need to read, <laughs> We should be clear that the Dungeon Master's Guide is still essential, and there are a lot of optional rules, variant rules. There are a lot of tools in here for creating various homebrewed worlds or NPCs, villains, magic items, or other additional options for your Dungeons & Dragons games. These are all really cool and useful tools, but you're only going to need them if it's going to come up in your game. If you're running a pre-written module like Lost Minds of Fandelver or Curse of Strahd, there's a lot of material in here that you probably won't need to reference. What I like to recommend is that you crack open the book to the table of contents and look at the things like creating adventures and creating non-player characters. Well, when you are actually going to make your own NPCs, read over that chapter. It's actually a really useful how-to guide on what to do for that. There are a few essential sections of this book that I think anyone should read. Much like before, the introduction on page six specifically has a great section ju just reminding you that you got to know your players and you got to know what they like. And it's a great bit of advice to review over. Beyond that, I would skip right ahead to chapter eight, which is called Running the Game, very appropriately. This is probably the chapter that is most useful for a dungeon master to read because it goes over the core rules of Dungeons and Dragons from the Dungeon Master's perspective. It's a perfect complement to chapter seven, eight, and nine from the player's handbook, but from the Dungeon Master's point of view. So it has great advice about when you should call for a strength check or how to decide whether it's a saving throw or an attack roll or an ability check that you need to roll. This section spans from page 233 to 261, but there are some really important sections that you should consider bookmarking within this chapter. On page 245, you're going to find the Conversation DCs, which is an excellent little section for running charisma-based skill checks during social elements of a D&D game. On page 246 is a truly indispensable section, the object AC and hit points. So when your players want to break down a door or smash a table or knock over a wall or do all those crazy improvised things that they always want to do, Here's how tough all the objects in the world are. <laughs> Speaking of improvising, page 249 includes tables for improvising damage and the damage severity by level so that you can properly estimate what sort of damage output you should be giving to your players based on the level they're at so that you don't outright murder them. <laughs> Fortunately, most of these tables are actually in the official Dungeon Master screen as well. But if you haven't read these sections yet and seen how to actually use these tables, there's great advice in here that will help you improvise and respond to the crazy things that your players decide to do. As we move past page 252, you get into a bunch of optional rules for things like chases, poisons, diseases, and madness. These are really excellent tools if you're planning to use them in your campaign, or if it starts to come up, these might be good sections to read when it's appropriate. Now on page 81 of the Dungeon Master's Guide till page 85, are the core rules for how to build a balanced combat encounter. How to choose monsters and make sure that the monster that you've chosen are a challenging or deadly or easy threat for your players. Unfortunately, these rules are super draconian and I actually don't recommend using them. Instead, I recommend you crack open Xanathar's Guide to Everything to page 88 to 91. The rules in XGTE for building encounters are much simpler, easier to use, and produce much better results in general. There are several online tools that can help you build combat encounters. Many of these tools are built on the rules in the Dungeon Master's Guide and aren't as good as the rules in Xanthar's. You should also consider looking at chapter seven of the DMG, which starts on page 135. This includes all of the rules for magic items. And without a doubt, this is the section of the Dungeon Master's Guide that I use the most. It's a really handy reference when I'm coming up with my game for the night. What magic items am I going to award the players for completing the tasks they're setting out on? 
The Dungeon Master's Guide has these rules and they're great, but you should also consider looking at the same page, 135, in Xanathar's Guide to Everything, which has expanded on the rules for giving out magic items appropriately in your Dungeons & Dragons game. Combining these two together are really essential tools that a Dungeon Master needs to know to award the players properly without risking breaking their game, overpowering the characters, or giving them things that they might not need or use. Instead of using the random magic item tables in the Dungeon Master's Guide, the XGTE tables are much more clear cut and will help you give an appropriate number of magic items that won't overpower your players. Beyond these essential sections, Chapter one of the Dungeon Master's Guide, particularly page nine, has some great discussion of the core assumptions of Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition, particularly when it comes to world building and creating your campaign world itself. So after I read these essential sections, I would point you towards chapter one of the DMG. That said, when it comes to setting expectations, there's one set of expectations that you need to set, not with the rules of the game, but with your players before anything else. And to do that, you need to have a session zero, which is not a concept that Dungeon Master's Guide talks about at all. Inside the book, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, on page 139, there is an extremely handy section on running a session zero. Running a session zero, we believe, is something that should be essential for starting a D&D game. It allows everybody to have an understanding of the game that they're about to play, everybody can get on the same page with expectations, and then move forward into a game that will be more fun and benefit a lot from the collaborative journey that you're about to set out on together. These rules were a little late to the game, and we do think that they would have been better placed in the Dungeon Master's Guide. So if you are looking for rules on how to set up a session zero, grab Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, or you can also check out a video that we made about session zero, which you can find right up there. Now, once you've made your way through the Dungeon Master's Guide, the last book that you will wanna pick up and go through is the Monster Manual. Fortunately, this is the one that is best organized as a table reference tool because all the monsters are in alphabetical order for the most part and they're pretty easy to find and run right out of the book. I love reading the monster manual just in my spare time to get inspiration and if I ever hit writer's block when I'm planning an adventure, I just crack this open to a random page and try to find a monster that I've either never used before or haven't used in a very long time and say, well, what if this monster showed up in the adventure tonight? Something that I feel is very underrated about the monster manual is no, you do not need to read every monster, but if you're struggling to come up with an idea for your adventure, reading those little paragraphs of lore about a monster that you're interested in could inspire an entire ad adventure or even an entire campaign. There's a lot of great tools that you can find just by reading about what environments the monsters inhabit, what their layers might look like, what they like to do. It could inspire many things in your D&D games. The most important part though about this is reading the section on how to understand monster stat blocks. Fortunately, that's right at the beginning of the book and the really finicky rules like legendary actions and recharge rules, all those things are found on page 10 and 11. It's a good part to bookmark if you need to remind yourself how legendary monsters work. Just read over that first section at the beginning. That's the only bit of required reading that I would say is necessary for the Monster Manual. The only thing that's really handy to bookmark in the Monster Manual is on page 342, Appendix B, Non-Player Characters. This is a section of generic non-player character stat blocks. And I will say that 95% or more of the NPCs I use in my game use a stat block out of this section of the book. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> All you need is this and a name, which you can get from the random names in the Player's Handbook or Xanathar's Guide to Everything, and a couple adjectives to help roleplay, and you basically have everything you need to run an NPC. So between these three books, there is actually less reading that you need to do than you may have expected when you first saw the 900 pages of information set out before you. Yeah, about 35 pages from the Player's Handbook, another 30 or so from the Dungeon Master's Guide, and maybe another 10 or 15 in other places of the other books. That's actually a lot more forgiving than my English 101 class in my first year of university. 
Yeah, it's much easier to jump into Dungeons and Dragons when you know what you need to know. And up on screen right now, here are the sections that we recommended from the Player's Handbook with a list of the page numbers associated with those sections and highlighting the sections that we think that you should bookmark. Now here we see the Dungeon Master's Guide with the same information laid out for you. So take a look at that. That has all of the pages that we think are most relevant from the Dungeon Master's Guide. And finally, we have the Monster Manual. This has a few sections here that we think are essential reading, but keep in mind that the Monster Manual can be a great place to go for inspiration for your D&D games. Finally, here's a couple of the supplemental page sections from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything and Xanathar's Guide to Everything that we mentioned in this episode. And for all of you that want something that you can print out or look at, we've prepared a useful Google Doc in the links below that you can download that has our full reading list completely summarized for you as well. So the next time someone tells you or another dungeon master that you need to read all the rules, remember that that's not entirely true. I have never sat down and dedicated in a dedicated way, read all these rules cover to cover. I've read them in piecemeal, in bits and pieces, starting with the most important pieces of information. Hopefully this is a great starting point for you as a new dungeon master on what you actually need to read. And beyond that, hopefully some of our videos here on YouTube will give you help and context as well as you start out running your first campaign. So this has been a look at our essential reading guide for new Dungeon Masters in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. If you feel like we missed an essential section, please let us know in the comments below. The videos that we create on our channel are made possible thanks to the incredible generosity of our Patreon supporters. If you enjoy the work that we do here on YouTube, please consider joining our community by following the links in the description below. If you are a fan of our work, you might be interested in hearing that we are creating a book for 2021. We've partnered with Ghostfire Games to kickstart an upcoming campaign module based on our live play series, Dungeons of Drakenheim. You can find all the information regarding this by following the link in the description. If you're interested in seeing what Drakenheim is all about, you can check out our live play, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash dungeon underscore dudes. And you can find all the previous episodes of that campaign right up over here. And we've got plenty more great advice for new Dungeon Masters and experienced ones in our playlist right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the Dungeon. dungeon.